the intersection of endurance sport, health, fitness and life. Challenging conventional ideas and empowering people with the science of self-propelled motion. This is the Endurance Experience Podcast, hosted by Tony Rich. In the moment of stepping into the water, starting to swim. much numb. You cannot think about the fact that you're about to swim the English Channel four times. You just have to take it into pieces and compartmentalize each section. My goal at the start of the swim really was to swim until the sun comes up. And I knew that if everything was going according to plan, by the time the sun comes up, just through this half of the night, I'll be halfway across on my first crossing. In the marathon swimming world, there's a lot of swims that hundreds of people have done. You know, you've got the Catalina Channel, you've got the swim around Manhattan, you've got the English Channel, you know, and they're just these cool, iconic swims. And, you know, it's fun to do those as well and kind of add your name to the list. But it's kind of special to be able to say that you were the first to do something. I was the first to swim down and back across Lake Tahoe. I was the first to swim um, down and back across Lake Memphremagog. It's special to do something that's groundbreaking and that's never been done. It just kind of captures your imagination a little bit more to have that opportunity to do something new, to do something fresh and to kind of break boundaries. My guest on this podcast is Sarah Thomas. And as you heard from that intro, she is the first person to swim the English Channel four times without stopping. She's an endurance athlete, a committed coach, a keynote speaker, and also a cancer survivor and actually got a diagnosis during the preparation process for that monumental endeavor. There have been many people on this podcast that have done phenomenal things. And everything from Olympians and Olympic medalists uh, to amateur athletes that have done uh, phenomenal feats of endurance. But i got to admit, this probably is among the top, certainly out of all of the uh, non-professional athletes. I mean, uh, she's done an incredible thing on her own time and being a working individual. So that just frames how incredible this accomplishment was. And the thing is, the four-time English Channel swim is really only one of her notable swims. She's done Lake Powell, 80-mile swim. She's done Lake Champlain. 104.6 mile swim. She's done double lake. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word. <laughs> 50 miles mem- from a gog. And uh, the Manhattan Isle Island Marathon swim, 28 and a half miles, among many other notable swims. So we talk about her origin story, and I asked Sarah how she got into swimming and open water swimming and what was her inspiration. And we deep dive into some of her notable swims like Lake Champlain and some of the other big accomplishments. And then we talk about the cancer diagnosis and her treatment and how that changed, if at all, her mindset and her training and physical conditioning. And then we talk about the English Channel four-way swim, and she, at a high level, takes us through each of the four laps of the 
English Channel 4-Way. And I talk about legacy and does she think about the, her legacy as a marathon swimmer. And we had a couple of fun exchanges about Diana Nyad and whether or not uh, she had an opinion on Diana Nyad. That was funny and interesting. But also I asked Sarah when they make the movie about her and her life, who would play her? <laughs> so we had a great conversation, a fun uh, conversation and interesting. And it was just great to marvel at Sarah and what she's done in her accomplishments. She's still out there doing it, still out there swimming, still out there coaching, she's coaching masters. I'll be sure to drop in and meet her and her husband when I go out there in Colorado, drop in on her master's team. And of course, you could catch her on her website, sarahthomasswims.com, in case you want to book Sarah for a speaking engagement or coaching. So, I hope you enjoy this conversation. It's fun. Without further delay, I give you Sarah Thomas. <laughs> All right, I am on with Sarah Thomas. Thanks for coming on to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Excited to chat. All right. So I've been, for the past week or so, researching and doing a lot of reading about some of your endeavors. Amazing. And uh, it's good to be on with Aqua Woman herself. <laughs> <laughs> You know, surprise, uh, my hair's not wet. <laughs> <laughs> do you talk to fish too? <laughs> yep, I sure do. <laughs> so I'm reading, you know, uh, I I watched your documentary. So you have a documentary, uh, The Other Side, out there on YouTube. I watched it. Uh, pretty amazing. I, I recommend everyone watch it out. Actually post it in the show notes. So for those people that don't, no, Sarah, I'm just going to read the top of her uh, Wikipedia. Yeah, Wikipedia, you never know if it's 100% right, but you'll tell me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it says, she is the first person to complete four consecutive crossings of the English Channel and the first person to swim a current neutral swim over 100 miles. She holds the world record for longest, second, and third longest current neutral swims and in various other records in both fresh and salt water categories. Is that right? Yeah, seems about <laughs> right, I think. <laughs> wow. So yeah, um, there's a lot of things that I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about your, you know, some of your notable swims, including the, you know, the Lake, Lake Champlain swim. And of course, the four four way channel crossing and you know you've had some setbacks with the the cancer diagnosis as well and i want to talk about that and how that impacted your treatment and and also your training and you know where where do you think your legacy is in the marathon swimming world but before that let's dive into your origin story a little bit and if you can describe for our listeners your swimming experience and then how you got into open water swimming and what, what was the primary inspiration? Sure. Um, let's see here. I think that I learned how to swim about the same time I was learning how to walk. <laughs> so I feel like water has always been, it's like in my blood, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of like first remember swim lessons probably when I was like five or six and then like just begging um, my parents if I could be on the swim team. 
Like, I don't know what it was about being a young child and like desperately wanting to be on the swim team, but I did. Um, so I, you know, swam on the summer league team for a couple of years. And then I think my mom like blew my mind when she told me that there was a year round swim team that I could do. She's like, I know you like swimming. Do you want to do it all the time? And I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, so I basically swam like all through elementary school, all through high school, um, I swam at the University of Connecticut in college. So UConn. Um, yeah, UConn, go Huskies. Um and yeah, I just I loved I loved swimming, I loved training, I loved all of those things. Um, but I was just like pretty average pool swimmer. Um, I grew up in Texas where swimming is super duper competitive. Um, so I was, you know, a decent swimmer in Texas, but like I'm going to get a scholarship anywhere, you know, to a D1 school. Um, And so, I don't know, I had to like make a choice at the end of high school. Like, do I keep doing this thing or do I stop? Um, And there was just something in me that said, like, there's still more left for me in the water. So I walked on at UConn, no scholarship or anything like that. Um, Swam all four years, um, you know, highs and lows. And when I graduated, I thought I was retired from the sport of swimming. Um, moved to Denver for grad school and joined like an adult master swim team. And um, I had not been doing that very long. And some of my new like teammates were like, Sarah, you got to do open water. And um, it was something I'd like never really thought about. You know, I grew up in Texas, the lakes near Dallas are not quite delightful. Um, So it does, they don't like scream, like swim in me um, the way that some of the lakes here in Colorado do. And so I took some like coercion and, you know, I had to like stew on it. Um, But they talked me into signing up for a 10 K open water swim outside of Fort Collins. Um, And so I did my very, very first open water swimming into open water swim in 2007. Um, And I did, I just completely, totally, fell in love with open water swimming. It just took one. And I was like, all right, this is what I should have been doing all of these years. I'm done with the pool. Like, give me these lakes because this is where the fun is really at. Yeah. I mean, you're swimming inside of a a concrete box. Mm -hmm. When you finally get out in open water, it's, it's nice, but there's a, there's a fear element though, that people have, did you, did you not have that fear element at all? You know, I think um, if I was swimming, if I had started like in the ocean or even a lake in Texas where it's murky and you don't know if there's snakes coming for you, right. um, I think that would have increased the fear factor a little bit. But the lakes here in Colorado are pretty chill. Um, not a ton of like wildlife to be concerned about. They're clean. They're clear. Um, so I think that made it a little bit easier to like take that leap um, and just like, oh, gosh, this is actually just really pretty. Yeah. Wow. And what were your events when you swam at UConn? Um, I was always a distance swimmer. Um, I think I, yeah, thousand mile, all of those. Um, in high school, I swam breaststroke um, and then just kind of got away from it. And I like hit started hitting the exact same time repeatedly for years. Um, I couldn't get any faster. And my coaches were like, let's try something different, Sarah. <laughs> like, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, and the distance. you were uh, a New England. Uh, it's too bad we didn't keep you over here in New England. We could have used I you. Know. The winters in New England, I said, I cannot do this anymore. <laughs> Texas girl to Connecticut um, was not a good, a yeah. good transition. If you just make it past January and February, those Ooh. are the two that get you. Yeah, they sure do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, you wow. And so when you did that 10K, that was it. You were hooked mm-hmm. on open water. Wow. And, you know, just looking at some of the things that you, you've done, man, it just the the adjectives don't do it justice. You need new words to describe, <laughs> uh, you know, it's just, you know, the, the four way I think might be the, the greatest endurance accomplishment and anyone's ever done i mean i can't think of i mean there's uh marathoners that you know run for days and such but we're not humans are not 
evolved to swim, to spend that much time in the water. It's just absolutely incredible. So let's talk about some of the swims. So there's the Lake Champlain swim that you did, but what were what were some of the, the big swims that you did before up to Lake Champlain? Sure. Um, so I'll say, you know, I started in 2007 with the 10K, did that for a few years and was like, I need to go farther. Um, so I kind of jumped from that 10K distance to um, doing things like the Catalina Channel, which is about 20 miles. And like the English Channel is about 20 miles. So I kind of hung out in that like 20 mile range, um, did those types of more like traditional marathon swimming right. swims um, to start. And then kind of in 2012, I remember like standing on the shore in France, having just swum the English Channel. And I'm like looking back and I'm like, I think I can go farther. Like, I think I could swim back to England right now. Um, and so that's kind of where things escalated rather quickly. Um, so I was like, okay, if I could swim back right now, what else can I do that's like 40 miles? Um, and we start get to like 40 mile, 50 mile swims. There's like not a lot of people doing that. Right. Um, and people are kind of like, what is wrong with you? Um, so in 2013, I swam down and back across Lake Tahoe. Um, and then like six or seven weeks later, I s went down and back across Lake Memphremagog, which is in Vermont and Canada. Um, and those were like two swims that like people had tried to do a double crossing of before and like had failed. And like in the case of Tahoe, people are like, it's too cold and it's too high. Like no one could ever do this without like killing themselves. Um, and I did both of those and they were fun. And um I don't know, like, it, just like being able to be like, man, I just swam 50 miles. Um, what else can I do? You know, like, that's kind of a weird <laughs> way to like flip flop yourself. Um, so I did those in 2013. Um, and then it was still, it was like, okay, I want to do more. And so then in 2016, I did 80 miles across Lake Powell, which is in Arizona and Utah. Um, and when I did the 80 mile swim, like that was the longest swim ever without a current. Right. Um, and so like, it was crazy. Um, cause you know, like to go from 50 miles to 80 miles, like, Oh, it's easy to say like 50 to 80, but like 30 miles is a real long way to swim. <laughs> so, right. um, it was, you know, if I think about like one of the hardest things I've ever done, it was definitely that Lake Powell swim in 2016 because there was just so much unknown to it. Um, didn't know if I was training right. You know, it was a record for distance at the time. So like going into like uncharted territory and like not having a clue how my body was going to react to two full nights of like not sleeping, um, you know, just, it was a mind altering experience in a lot of ways. Right. Uh, and so then, you know, coming out of Lake Powell, you know, I think it was a 56 hour swim, um, and like the very next day, I was like, I had more left in the tank. Like, I think I could have gone farther. Um, and so that's where the Lake Champlain swim came from was, okay, 80 miles wasn't far enough. Like, all right, let's double down. Let's add another 20 miles. I had to get over 100. <laughs> yeah. Like no one's ever broken 100 miles before. Let's go. Um, and so we, d we did. <laughs> yeah. And if people are not familiar with Lake Champlain, so this is basically the lake that sort of bifurcates Vermont and New York goes all the way up to Canada and you swam it what south to north we did kind of so my original plan for Lake Champlain was to go from south to north and swim the entire length of it that's what the dream was when I was looking at it, um, we started to do some research um, into the lake and found that there is potentially a slight current that goes from south to north. Um, and if I wanted to claim it as a current neutral swim, we were worried that there would be like a perception of a current um, that yeah. assisted me. So we actually started pretty far north, um, almost in Canada. And I did kind of an out and back loop. Um, so I, you know, I started north, I swam, you know, a little over 50 miles down, looped a little island, and then we went back up the way we came. So we made 100 miles nonstop, you know, never got out of the water, never touched the ground, nothing like that. 
Um, so it wasn't quite the like dream of like crossing the lake that I wanted. Um, but we did want to make sure that it was considered a current neutral swim. So if you go out and back, you can't claim that you got a current. Right. And, and that went down as the first human to complete that swim. Correct. Yes. Yep. Wow. And still the only, no one's ever gone over a hundred miles yet. So, and that was in 2017. So it's been a minute. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. And then, so that's just, let's just sit with that for a minute. That's, <laughs> yeah, again, it's, you know, words can't just describe how incredible that is. So, you know, and that's, that's when you started thinking about more, like doing the channel multiple ways. And, but before that, that's when you got the diagnosis of, uh, the cancer diagnosis, how did that make you feel, you and your husband? And then did you did you doubt that you could still swim at that point? Yeah. So, um, you know, I finished Lake Champlain in August of 2017. Um, the four-way English Channel was actually already, like, booked. Um, there's a wait list to swim the English Channel. Um, and then if you're wanting to go real far, you need a really big window. And so the wait, it was, I think I had to wait about two and a half, maybe three years um, for my English channel slot. So I'm swimming in Lake Champlain in 2017. I already have the four-way English channel booked, right? Like it's planned. Um, I paid a deposit. Like we know that that is what is coming next in um, 2019. So I had like two years in between Lake Champlain um, and the English channel swim. Um, And so, you know, I was in the middle of like trying to plan 2018, right? Like I'm booking all these swims that I think can like help me prepare for the four way. Uh, You know, I'm like, like fired up, like ready to go. Like, okay, what am I going to do to get ready for this like monster of a swim in two years? Um, But then in November of 2017, so August was the end of Lake Champlain. And then I'm in November. um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, definitely came out of the blue, um, very unexpected, right? Like no family history. I was 35 years old, um, otherwise healthy. Like that is not something that you think is going to happen. Yeah, um, top shape, I, in yeah, better shape like, than... yeah, it's like, how does this, like, how, like, how does it happen? Right. And it's a lot to like wrap your brain around. Um, you know, I, I found the lump on my own, you know, I went to my like regular doctor, um, and like, God bless her. She was like, Sarah, you, you need follow up now. Um, a lot of times women of my age, like you find a lump, they tell you just like to wait. Um, they assume it's just a cyst or something very benign. Um, and people wait too long and it can really escalate into something yeah, really terrible. Um, and I'm, so I'm really glad <laughs> for that doctor who was like, this is a big deal. You need to get this checked out. Was it any um, stage? Um, it was, sta- I was stage two. Um, so I had like two tumors and then I had um, some like cancer in one of my lymph nodes in my armpits. Um, so def- like basically three, three tumors. Um, it was with something called triple negative breast cancer, which means it's not hormonal. Um, it has the like highest rate of recurrence. Um, and like the survival rate is only like 70, somewhere between 60 and 70% compared to like other breast cancers that have a much higher survival rate. So it's like really terrifying. So like you're tip top shape, you're like on top of the world, you've just done this crazy swim, you've got another one coming up. And then like all of a sudden, like you're getting chemo, Um, you're going through surgeries, you're getting radiation. Um, And the doctors like really don't know. Um, When you ask them like, hey, can I swim 80 miles next year? (laughs) They're like, (laughs) that is a weird question. No one has ever asked me that before. Um, And we didn't, so we had no idea, right? Like, am I going to respond to treatment? Will it take away my, you know, endurance ability to keep swimming? Like it was just a a whole bunch of unknown. Um, And that's really scary. Everything that goes on in your frontal, everything that with swimming, Mm -hmm. body, your arms, your your backs, your backs, everything that goes on up front. Yep. Yep. And that's, um, I don't know, um, how much people want to know about having a mastectomy. Um, 
but it's not a good time. And um, what they do, um, you have choices, um, but like the most common thing that people do is you, um, so you have a mastectomy. And then if you have reconstruction, they put your breast implant underneath your pec muscle. And so that completely alters so yeah. much of swimming, yeah. right? Like you use your pecs predominantly. And now all of a sudden I've got something that's like pulling and stretching my pec muscle in a very unnatural way. Um, and the surgeons, like literally they're like, we don't know, like we don't have anything to compare you to. We don't know how it's going to impact your swimming. Like you could be fine. It could not be fine. We don't know. Um, and that's really terrifying when someone just tells you, we don't know, we're just going to have right. to wait and see. And so did you find in the end that that impacted your strength? Or yeah, your I would say, you know, so um, I had my mastectomy in May. So um, and then I had to go through radiation, which also messes up more things than you can even comprehend. Um, so kind of between May and the end of August, um, I was trying to swim as much as I could. It was really hard. Um, after you have a mastectomy, I couldn't raise my arm over my shoulder, um, for I think four weeks and I couldn't swim for about eight weeks. Um, and so that's a really hard motion to like relearn basically yeah. after you haven't done it for eight weeks and after you've had a lot of physical changes to your chest. Um, so like getting back into it was really hard, really painful. Um, you know, I had to start with just like kicking and trying to just like even just getting my arms over my head was hard. Yeah. Um, so what, I mean, it was, it was a major challenge getting back into it. Um, yeah, I can't even like, it's hard to describe like what it felt like to just, okay, I'm in the pool, I'm floating, but my arms don't work right. Um, and so I, I did, I had to kind of relearn a little bit of my stroke technique. Even to this day, my right arm is a little wonky. I definitely lost some range of motion, definitely lost some strength and some power. Um, and, you know, and I knew all of that and, you know, I'm finishing radiation and there's like a year between when I finished all my cancer treatment and when I'm signed up to some English channel um, and they make you kind of pay half of your fee a year out. And so I remember the English Channel boat captain emailing me and he's followed on Facebook. So he knows what I'm going through. And he's like, I hate to ask you this, but like, are you still coming? Yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah, I'm coming. Um, but I didn't know, you know, like I had a, I had a year to like completely rebuild um, all of that endurance, all of that just physical strength. Um, and I didn't know, like, yeah. is it going to be enough? Is this enough time? Ready, fire, aim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically, right? Like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna go for this, and who knows what's gonna happen? Yeah, wow. And then so you, but you, that's just a testament to you, and that you, you kept your mind in it, and knew that you still wanted to do it, and um, you dedicated. Did you dedicate the swim to the survivors? I did. Uh, is that what I read? Uh, yeah, I did. That's um, amazing. Yeah. You know, it was because it was, it was just, it's a journey, you know, like no one wants a cancer diagnosis, um, but it's a community too. Right. And kind of once, once you've truly been impacted by cancer um, in a like a real personal way, um, it's like you're bonded with any other person who's been truly hit by it. And so I think it was super important to me to like keep that in my mind when I was training and, you know, when I was in the channel, like this is bigger than me. You know, this is not just about the swim anymore. This is about anyone who's ever had a setback, anyone who's ever been told that they can't do something. And I'm going to show them that, yeah, you can work hard and you can overcome way more than you think you can and way more than other people think you can. Exactly. hundred percent. Okay, let's talk about the the actual channel crossing uh, four way. So, for people who don't know, so the channel is what? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Twenty one miles if you're swimming straight. Yeah. So you did England, France, France, England, England, France, France, England. Is that right? Correct. So, yeah. Okay. Wow. Just so this, if you can take me through each of the four 
what laps just mm -hmm. high level sure. what do you remember um you know take me through some of some of it as you made each turnaround are sure. there things that stick out to you with each one mm -hmm. yeah the, i would say each lap had its own journey if you will um and so that's kind of fun to like look back on it um because in the moment you're just like one arm at a time, you know, like we're just going to make it through, you know, from one feed to the next. And like, yeah. you're just kind of like in the moment. But then when you get to like, look back on it, you're like, wow, that was kind of wild how all that um, played out. Um, so just kind of like high level, the way it works when you show up in England to swim the English channel, um, there's usually other people. So you're kind of waiting in line and then you have to like, coordinate the weather right you need a good weather window because they right. won't take you out if it's crazy and then you kind of have to coordinate the weather with the right time for the tides um so you can't just start an english channel swim whenever you want right you need to they time it with the tides so that you kind of get a push off the coast and catch the currents the right way because no one swims the english channel in a straight line unless you've got okay. um like a super incredibly fast swimmer so everyone has a, like an s curve into their swim and so the pilots are really adept at reading the currents reading the tides um and kind of getting you in the right place at the right time so that you actually land in france and don't get swept out to sea um so we waited a really long time um the weather was not ideal um we almost didn't think that we were going to get a chance to swim um and so it kind of just the way things worked out is we ended up having to start the swim at like midnight, um, which is not an ideal time to start something that you're going to be doing for multiple days. It just kind of messes with your sleep pattern. Um, it's kind of, you know, you're going to get extra dark, dark time, maybe more than you wanted. So kind of starting it, it felt almost like a little bit like a disadvantage to, you know, we're, we're kicking off at midnight. Um, so lap number one, um, was really pretty basic, which is nice. It's kind of, it kind of went how you would want lap number one to go. I'm um, just like, no real drama. I think I, I think I puked up dinner at one point. Um, I had spaghetti and like right around dawn, I'm like just barfing up all the spaghetti that I had, but like not concerned about okay. it. Like it was fine. Um, you know, like maybe but you do go with it. solid food, you go with yeah, solid like, food versus liquid nutrition. Yeah, I normally like drink everything, right? So my normal calories are um, like carbohydrates, a little bit of protein and some electrolytes. Um, and so like the spaghetti coming up was dinner from the night before. Um, clearly a bad choice to eat spaghetti. Um, it, but it was fine, right? So, you know, we, we, we go across, the weather is delightful. Um, I went across it right at like 11 and a half hours. Um, when I did my solo in 2012, I was like 11 hours and 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was super happy, right? Like 11 and a half hours for a one way, um, like perfect timing. The tides tend to change about every 12 hours. Um, so there is some disadvantage in like what I was doing to have gone too fast. Um, so I was really happy with the pace. Like everything was just like perfect for lap number one. Um, and then so the way the rules work when you change direction is that you um, get to shore. If there's a beach, you can walk out and exit and then but you have to immediately reenter the water. So you're only out of the water for like seconds, really. And you have to be back in the water um, and you have to start swimming within 10 minutes. And so we get to France and I'm just on like rocks and so when you hit rocks, there's no rule that you have to like go rock climbing to get out. So basically I hit France. I cannot go any further. And so I'm doing my 10 minutes just like in the water um, and trying to just, you know, like you have like lube for like chafing and stuff. So like I'm in the water, I'm like hanging onto this rock with the current, like pulling me really strong um, and trying to like put some more lanolin on so I don't chafe and uh, my friend Elaine was with me in the water and she's like giving me like a snack. I ate some rice. Um, and then like 10 minutes goes really fast. And so then Bet. they yell at you. They're like, your 10 minutes is up. You got to start swimming. And you're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm still chafing. Um, and so lap number two, um, we took off. Um, I hit a jellyfish like immediately in my face. Um, oh, and I remember no. thinking like, this is ominous. <laughs> like this lap isn't going to be as easy as the first one. Um, 
there was, I mean, there was jellyfish everywhere. I'm surprised I only hit one, but it did. It like just hit, like it hit me all straight down my face. Um, so like my nose and my chin are just like throbbing. I'm like, okay, here we go. Lap number two. Um, and what's the water on this second lap? What's the water quality like in wa water temperature and just qual yeah. quality of the water? Yeah, it's, um, I think the whole swim water temp was like mid 60s, I think like 62 yeah. to 64 ish, if I remember correctly. Um, I was comfortable water temp wise. Um, that wasn't, you know, wasn't my one of my big concerns um, was not water temp. Um, the English channels choppy. Um, so it was choppy, but it wasn't like wild. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I've swum in worse conditions for sure. Yeah. Um, it tends to be a little bit warmer in France, a little colder in England. Um, so yeah. Um, lap number two is when, so like the middle of lap number two was when the sun was going to go back down on me. Right. So I'd swum for midnight, watch the sunrise and now I'm coming back and now it's nighttime. Um, historically I have kind of a hard time at night. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I remember watching the sunset. It was a really stunning sunset. Uh, and just like trying to like amp myself up, like I'm going to swim all night long. Um, like I'm going to swim all night long because I knew once I got back to England, right. It was going to be around 24 hours and be midnight. It was going to be real tempting to just be like, okay, I did an English channel double. Yeah. I'm out. Um, so I'm amping myself up, like swim all night. Don't just get to England. You got to turn around. You got to make the turn. Um, but then I'm also getting just like nauseous. Um, and as the sun goes down, I'm like fighting the nausea as hard as I can fight it. But like, I can tell, like, it's going to be a long night, you know, like I'm, I'm going to be puking. Um, I think I puked like once around sunset and I was like, okay, maybe I'm going to feel better. Like I did after the spaghetti, right. um, like maybe that's it. I'm going to be done, but it did not get better. Um, and so lap number two really was just like trying to find the, like, I don't know, the, the gumption, the grit um, to like, okay, I'm going to make it through this and I am going to turn around when I get to England. Um, so we did, we swam, we got to England. Uh, I think I was like right around 12 hours um, mm -hmm. for lap number two, which again was like great considering that I was feeling a little nauseous. Um, we hit, we weren't able to get to a beach. So there's like a seawall. So I tagged the seawall. Um, Elaine's in the water with me again. And I, she's asking me like, I know you're not feeling good. What do you want to eat? And so she gave me a pouch of baby food bananas. And so I like slurped it down, you know, kind of like a gel slurped it down and then just like instantaneously puked it back up. Um, and I was like, uh oh, like we are in trouble. Yeah. And I remember telling her, food. yeah, like, I don't know what's going to happen here. Um, I remember telling her too, like, I know we've just been swimming for 24 hours, but it feels a lot longer than 24 hours. Um, and she was like, us too. And so, you know, I'm kind of whining, I'm puking. Um, and the boat people are like, 10 minutes is up, better start swimming. Um, and so I did, you know, you just, your choice is, do I quit or do I put my head down and go again? And I did, I put my head down and I started swimming. Um, I was really encouraged kind of the one thing that was maybe like keeping me going was that I could see a bunch of other channel boats were going out. So there was other swimmers starting. So I knew like, okay, the weather's still holding, like the forecast is great. Um, like there's other people going out again. Like I'm right on time with the tides, you know, like all of those were like, okay, I, I know I have an opportunity. Um, however, like I'm really sick and I did, I puked all night long. I couldn't hold anything down. Um, it was midnight. Right. And so like, I had about six hours of just like full darkness um, and just puking. And I'm, you know, yelling at everybody, like, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I'm tough enough. Um, and they're telling me like, Hey, we can see all these other channel boats out here. Like you're keeping up with everybody. Like you maybe feel terrible, but like, you're still swimming fine. Right. Um, and Elaine, is she has infinite wisdom, my friend Elaine. And she yelled down at me at one point and she was like, Sarah, don't make a decision in the dark. And what she meant was swim until the sun comes up and then we can kind of reevaluate the situation. But like, right. don't make the decision in the dark. 
And it's so smart, right? And that gave me a target, like, okay, just swim until the sun comes up, see if you can fight it, see if you feel better. Um, and my crew, super encouraging, like, hey, you're, you're you're not sucking, you know, you're not failing. So just, you know, we know that you feel awful, but like, see what happens. Um, and sure enough, the sun came up, my nausea went away. Um, I was able to like get some actual nutrition down. Um, we had some like peanut M&Ms on the boat. And I'm thinking like, God, I got to like rebuild some calories and fast or else I'm not going to make it on lap number four. And so they're feeding me M&Ms and, you know, we're just like, okay, how do we rebuild from this like crazy, horrible night? Um, and we did the sun came up. I felt better. Um, I felt like refreshed. I think they started sending me down some mouthwash <laughs> from all the vomit. Um and I did that, you know, like an hour or two after the sun was up, I remember yelling up at everyone and I was like, sorry, I was so whiny overnight, but <laughs> if it's okay with you, we're going to turn around when we get to France. Uh, and they were like, yay. Um, and so we did, we swam the rest of the way, relatively uneventful, you know, I'm like recovered. Like, I still don't know how my body recovered from like six hours straight of just puking everything out of its system, but was able to recover. Um, we get close to France. The tides are crazy when you're off the coast of France. Um, you said I'm like about 36 hours into swimming and they're like, Hey, tides are turning. You got to sprint. And I remember thinking like 36 hours into the swim, you think you, I can sprint right now. Um, but I did put my head down. Um, we aimed, you know, for this point, and I truly had to swim about as hard as I could because I knew if we missed it, it adds hours. Um, so I'm swimming for this point as hard as I possibly can for about an hour. Um, and then, yeah, hit hit the rocks again. You know, we were hoping for a beach, um, but I'm, hit, I'm in the same, like, rock pile. Um, and, yeah, that was an English Channel three-way. Um, only five people in history, with me being number five, had ever done a three-way. Um, and so it was kind of crazy just to know that having finished three laps, I was already like a big part of history. You yeah. know, it's just kind of cool. Like no matter what happens here, like I just did something really special. Um, yeah. so I did my, did my 10 minutes in France. Um, and then we kicked off lap number four, um, before the swim, my boat captain had said like, Hey, if you if you make it to England or sorry, if you make it to France, I'll float you back to England like a log. And so I was just kind of like expecting lap number four to be very uneventful. Um, I was feeling totally fine. Like I wasn't all that fatigued. Um, you know, I felt like we had gone through the worst in lap number three. And so I was really optimistic going into lap number four. Um, and so, you know, we had kind of, estimated 12 hours per lap. I was right on track for that. So, you know, I'm thinking like a 48 to 50 hour swim. Um, so I get to the 48 hour mark, you know, we're in the middle of the night. Like I'm thinking I'm close, you know, like doesn't really matter. Like I wasn't too bothered when the sun went down. I'm like, I don't have to swim through this whole entire night. Um, like it's going to be fine. So I get to the 48 hour mark and my buddy Craig jumps in to do a pace swim with me. And he said like, Hey, you're stuck in kind of a weird current um, we really need you to do an hour of power and see if you can break through this current and get into the British inshore waters. Um, and so like, you know, I've been awake for two days at this point, so that doesn't entirely like register to me. Um, so I kind of think, okay, if I sprint for an hour, I'm going to be super close. Um, so I did, I sprinted with Craig for an hour, like it's pitch black. My whole crew was on the side of the boat screaming at me. I can't hear, I can't hardly see. I just know that they're making a lot of noise. Um, and so we finished this hour. Like I really truly swam as fast as I could. And I asked, well, how everyone, fast do you think you maybe oh a gosh. minute? I don't even 20 know. per hundred. Or I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> it probably wasn't that graceful. <laughs> wow. So, but the, asked, the, you know, the thing that uh, gets me though, is the sleep. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. No sleep, yeah, no drowsiness at all. Not really. Um, I drink a little bit of caffeine um, in my feeds. There's like, I use an electrolyte supplement that like noon is what it's called. And then um, there's caffeine in it, just like a little tiny bit. And that's enough to kind of keep me, keep me going. Yeah. So, wow. okay. And so, yeah. so yeah, we're at 48 hours. I'm sprinting. <laughs> Um, and we get done and I ask like, Hey, did I do enough? Um, 
And they don't know. They're like, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, yeah, it's just, it's one of those things you're like, okay, I'm out here in the middle of the English Channel. It's the middle of the night and you don't know where we are <laughs> is what right. it felt like. And it's like this, are we lost? You know, like what, and they can't explain all that to you, right? Because I've got earplugs in, you can't hear super well. Um, the boat is kind of high, so it's not like you can truly have conversations with people. And, you know, when you're in a current, you can't just stop, right? Because every moment that you're stopped is pushing you in the wrong direction. Um, and so all I can do is just, like, keep swimming. Yeah. Um, you know, and Elaine got in with me a couple of hours later, and she was like, hey, we think you've got about another horse tooth, which is that 10K race that I did first. So she's telling me, we think you've got about another six miles to go. And I'm like, it's hour 50. I'm supposed to be done now. And you're telling me I've got like three or four more hours to go. Like I'm not encouraged. Uh. <laughs> um, you know, and I, it's just, I, what I remember of those last few hours is just like, I was so confused because it's, you know, it's sleep deprivation, you know, it's two nights, it's dark. You can't really hear, um, you know, I'm asking questions and I'm getting told, we don't know which is fair, right? Like I'd rather them tell me we don't know than lie to me. Um, and so all I can do is just like keep swimming. Yeah. Right. And so then the sun starts to come up and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I have swum through two and a half nights. I didn't think that this was going to have to happen. Um, so the sun's coming up and then my buddy Carl jumps in and he said, Sarah, you're super close, but the tide's about to change on you again. So you have to swim as hard as you can in order to make it to shore right now. Um, and I'm not looking up, right? Like I'm not looking to see how close it is. I have no idea other than like, I can kind of feel the water churning and changing. Um, I can kind of feel an upwelling. So like suddenly it's like a little bit colder than it was. Yeah. I'm like, all right, here we go. And so I did, I, I put my head down. Um, I don't kick a lot when I swim. So I'm like, my arms are fried. I'm going to just kick as hard as I possibly can. Um, and so all I could literally see was like the boat was on my right. Um, Carl is on my left. Um, they brought out like the little Zodiac. So I knew I was close because they only bring that out when you're close. So I've got the Zodiac and Carl on my left. And I am like literally just every single ounce of energy that I have left. Yeah. And I'm just swimming. Like I'm getting water up my nose and it's like going straight down my throat. And I'm like, if I don't finish this soon, I might actually drown. Um, you know, like, and all of these things are just like rushing through your head. Like, am I going to finish this? Like, have I come this far only for the tide to turn on me again? Like, I don't know. Like he told me I was going to get floated back to England like a log. And now I'm like 17 hours in and I don't know if we're going to make it. And so I did swimming, swimming, like literally as hard as I can. I'm not looking, I'm focused only on like going as hard as I can possibly go. And then all of a sudden there was shore. Um, and I could see it underneath my fingers and I tried to stand up when I could and I fell straight back down. Yeah, and, I saw the, the content yeah. of you out there. Yeah, finishing crawl. it. I had to crawl out crawling, of the yeah. ocean <laughs> and just like flop on my back, like, holy cow, what just happened to me? Where I remember asking, like, where am I? Um, and they're like, Oh, you're at Shakespeare Beach. Like, I was like less than like a mile from where I started the swim. Um and I'm like totally disoriented. Like I had no idea what just happened to me. <laughs> now, how many total miles do you estimate? And because that was, if it was straight, it'd be what, 80 ish? Yeah. If it but was straight, it was much it's more like a little that. over 80. I don't, honestly don't count it that way because the current was pushing and pulling. So the current neutral distance is like 84 miles. Uh, what the current did to me was probably close to 100. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's <laughs> incredible. So going through that experience is, uh, do you think that that's the limit of what can humanly be done or can yeah. someone do it five, six times? Um, you know, I, it's not the limit of what can be done. I really? firmly believe that. Yeah. Um, in talking with my boat captain after that, his name's Eddie. Um, he has since told me, he's like, you know, my greatest regret, Sarah, is not turning you for lap number five. He was like, I knew what the really? current were going to do. 
And I think you had it in you to go another lap. He's like, we should have made another turn. Really? I don't know if I believe you on that, man, Eddie Spelling. However, um, you know, he's watched a lot of swimmers. um, And, I, you know, I kind of trust his instinct that if he thinks it would have been possible, then maybe it was possible. You know, you have to have a perfect window, right? Like you have to get that perfect conditions of like the weather cooperating for three days. Um, But I, you know, I think it it can be done. Well, you heard it. If anybody out there wants to try, <laughs> I think that's probably going to stand for a long time. I think that might be the greatest endurance accomplishment ever. I mean, that is just because you hear of ultra again, you hear of ultra marathon to doing 100 miles. You know, Dean Car- Carnassus ran for three, what, 300 miles, mm-hmm. but to do it swimming. Mm-hmm. When in an environment that humans didn't evolve to swim, certainly that long, you got to sleep. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And I do think, you know, I think that's where the limit is, is like, how far can someone go without sleeping? Right. You know, when you're doing yeah. those ultra like runs or cycles or rowing, um, you can stop and take a nap. Um, but you can right. only do that in the water, you know, like. Um, I've tried <laughs> to take a nap in the water and especially where there's a, you know, a current that could potentially push you way off course. Yeah, um, exactly. And that's the, you can't just stop. You know what I mean? There's, there's not a break to be had, like you're working the entire time. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where the limit is, is like, how long can humans go without sleeping? Yeah. And even the ultra marathon runners describe this sort of state of, it's almost like a state in between awake and sleep. Mm -hmm. It's like they're sleeping while they're running. I forgot what it's called. It's a Mm -hmm. scientific term for it. But you can't do that in swimming because you'll drift away. (laughs) Right. And you'll or drown. (laughs) Yes. That's what I remember at the end of Lake Champlain, which, you know, like that swim took me 67 hours. So longer than um, the English Channel Um, time-wise. And I remember at the end, we were trying to like find our landing spot and there was just like a bunch of lights and it was in the middle of the night. Um, and I'm like recollecting for my crew, like, oh yeah, I remember swimming by this. Like, we're not there yet. Like they're trying to pull me in. I'm like, we've got like more to go. Um, and it was almost like I was more like lucid and with it, um, having not slept for three days, um, than they were like on the boat. And I do think like, I'm usually very alert and like know where I am and what's going on. Um, Right. There's just like your brain doesn't get to turn off in the way I think you can in some other situations. Yeah, exactly. Wow. That is absolutely uh, inspiring. So what is, well, let me ask you this. What do you think you're out of all the, I know there's a big marathon swimming community. Where do you think your uh, accomplishments place? Are you, are you do you think about that where i place in history of marathon swimming and if so how do you see yourself it's a good question um you know i feel like in a lot of this my motivation has always been like what can i do you know like what's my personal limit you know like what's my potential um so it's hard for me to like compare myself to others or like or to like put myself in, um, I don't know. It's hard. It's a it's a hard question for me to answer because yeah. there's some like great people out there who have left like incredible legacies and like totally changed the sport of marathon swimming. You know, you think about like Gertrude Ederly, who was the first woman to swim the English Channel, or like Matthew Webb, the first person to swim that the English Channel. Right. You know, it's weird to like put yourself. Um, in that category with those like great people um, or people who have like spent set speed records across the channel or, you know what I mean? Like there's just so many different types of accomplishments. Yeah. Um, Do you have an opinion on, let me ask you this. Do you have an opinion on NIAD? I know this, (laughs) or is that, because I I know that's that's sort of a radioactive in the marathon swimming community. The people have different differing, thoughts on the accomplishment or what people believe was accomplishment but 
You don't have to answer if you don't. Because <laughs> I know the She's the definitely movie. a controversial figure within marathon swimming. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. matter what I would answer to that, it would make someone very mad at me. <laughs> yeah, is that seems to be the, you know, because this year they had the they had the movie come out on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And then I had sort of Annette Benning character playing her and then Jodie Foster character playing her, her friend. And, but what you've done, I mean, to me, seems like it might be the top of the apex of the marathon swimming world. I can't see, I mean, if somebody were to play you in the movie, who's going to, who's it going to be? Are you going to have your movie coming out? They better be super cute. <laughs> <laughs> who would play you? Who do you think would play you when the Sarah Thomas movie uh, comes out sometime? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the answer. That's so wild to even think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Well, what about the uh, book deal? Any any thoughts about writing a book about? Yeah, there is a book in progress. It's slow, very slow progress, but I am working on it. Um. Hopefully it'll be out this year at some point. I I would say probably three fourths of the way written. Um, so then you know it'll need to go through editing and all of that good stuff. But really hopeful that we can get the book out this year. Nice. I want to see the I want to see the book. I'll be the first one to get it. Amazing. The documentary is amazing. People can get that out there on YouTube right now. Um. Wow. So, and what are you doing in the meantime now? So you, you work nine to five and then you what coaching and swimming? Yeah, I work. I've got a full-time regular person job. <laughs> um, I coach, I think I've got 15 swimmers on my roster. Um, yeah. You know, a bunch of little things. Um, Co coaching uh, open water swimmers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I coach open water swimmers from around the world, um, which is fun. Um, I do coach a master's team here and there, um, kind of when I've got extra time, um, you know, working on the book, I write a column for outdoor summer magazine. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I, I feel like I'm kind of busy. <laughs> so if but, somebody wants to hire you to help them with their channel crossing or their first channel crossing or, or to do the five way, <laughs> how do they hire you? <laughs> They can go to my website, um, sarahthomasswims.com. Um, send me a message through my website. Yeah. I don't you know. Hire me for a speaking gig. I love to do speaking engagements. Speaking gigs too. Okay. Yeah. Um, great. Hey, I'm just glad I got a chance to sit out and talk to you and let people know that I had a, uh, an hour, almost an hour conversation yeah. with the great Sarah Thomas. This is incredible. Um, okay, so what words would you like to leave with uh, to inspire people that might listen to this and know your accomplishments? Oh, man, that's always such a tough question. <laughs> um, let's see here. I don't know. I think for me, it's not just about the swimming, right? I think the swimming is what gets attention and like what makes people like want to hear what I have to say. But if I have to say it, you know, it's not, I'm proud of the swimming, but what's more important is like the legacy that you're leaving in life. Um, right. And I really believe, you know, that like, if I can inspire like one person to just overcome some hurdle in their life, because they want to, you know, they've got some big dream, but something's holding them back. Like you can do it. You know what I mean? And it, it doesn't have to be in the water. It's, it's just, I feel like it's just deeper than that. You know, like be a good person and do your best, um, you know, with what you've been given. Like we're all dealt crap hands. Um, and it's not, it's not about the accomplishment, but it's about like what you are able to persevere through and, just I don't know if I'm making that very eloquent or not, but um, oh, I don't know. Right. I There's mean, just more to it, you know. Yeah. Be a good human. Let's leave yeah. it with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you were. We're all here. Even if you live to be a hundred, we're all going to be gone for mm -hmm. a long time. In which case, it's all about what you do here on the planet now, and yes. then how people are going to remember you. What you did, how you would 
how you inspired mm -hmm. and you embody all of that hundred percent. So thanks for having this conversation with me. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Hopefully I didn't ramble too much for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I loved it. Love it. Thanks. Thanks again to Sarah Thomas for coming on to the podcast. Check out the other side on YouTube link in the show notes. Check her out at sarahthomasswims.com, link in the show notes. And I'll wait for the book and the movie. And I can't wait to see who they're going to pick to play Sarah Thomas in the movie. I don't know a lot about marathon swimming. I follow loosely, but... The first person to swim a current neutral swim over 100 miles. That accomplishment has got to be one of the greatest endurance accomplishments, male or female. And on that alone, she's got to be considered one of the greatest in amateur endurance athletes ever. On top of that, what she's done in the teeth of a cancer diagnosis was something that just even adds on to her legend. So one of the lessons that we take away from people like Sarah is that maybe sometimes going faster is not the way that you want to challenge yourself. And so as endurance athletes, sometimes it's commonplace where we do one event, we immediately want to surpass that event by going faster this time. But maybe you don't think about going faster. Maybe you challenge yourself in a different way. Just like Sarah found out, hey, I'm not the fastest pool swimmer. Maybe there's other ways to challenge myself. And maybe if you want to set yourself apart from other people or other competitors, maybe you just have to find some things that you will be willing to do, whereas other people are not willing to even attempt those things. Of course, it doesn't necessarily have to be swim the English Channel four times without stopping could be a very modest and personal goal, something like a streak. If you're a hiker or a mountain climber, maybe it's to do the seven summits or whatever it is, but find unique ways to challenge yourself and set yourself apart from other people. Follow Event Horizon Endurance Sport on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter for training programs and services to become a member of our Endurance Institute or for a complete archive of podcasts, log on to our website eventhorizon.tv.